Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kristen and I am one of the good doctors of Abbey Research. Abbey Research exists to empower empathetic and communities and educate them. And those are all really big buzzwords for what we really mean, which is helping everybody actually get along in a more cohesive way. Not like Hallmark cards or Kumbaya, but actually understand each other better so that we can live life fuller. This series is, a, is part of the in service to that. It's called Welcome to My World. And I get a chance to sit down with fascinating folks who are different than me, which is everybody, about what one of the things that makes them different in a hope that we can all understand each other better. And I will tell you right now, today's guest is wonderful, but very different than me. And we will be exploring that in one of the ways in which we differ explorously today. So I today we have with us Angelique Santana, who is a chef and one of my new favorite people that I just met her less than a year ago through our mutual friend, Trisha Brooke. She is the owner and founder of Eat with Angelique, the small business that she launched with a singular mission in mind to guide people towards a healthy lifestyle, starting but not ending with the food that they eat. She's a speaker, a published author, a health coach, and of course, a chef. Angelique, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So <laughs> what, the way that we are different is that you, ma'am, are a vegan, and I really like all the animal products. So talk to me about when this started, why this started. Talk to me about being a vegan. Yes, it began in 2012. I was going to school to become a certified health coach through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And halfway through the program, you're learning, you know, throughout the whole program, over a hundred different dietary theories and veganism was one of them. And at the time I was also probably like 50 pounds overweight and uh, I'm five foot four. So I, I was really, you know, like 180, 190, something like that. And, uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to do 28 days. I'm going to go vegan. And so I did that and I lost 25 pounds. And so that's how it happened. Uh, I didn't, um, stay that way. Right. After the 28 days, I went back to eating how I ate before. Uh, but I found that my tastes were not the same. And so little by little, I went vegetarian. Okay. And then two years later, I went vegan. Okay. In 2014, my percep my perspective is that it would have been very difficult to find vegan ingredients and vegan products in a lot of like supermarkets and things. Am I incorrect? Yes. Good. Okay. Tell me. Yeah. Talk to me about it. Yeah. And, and it definitely has gotten better even okay. since then. Great. So, um, yeah, there weren't that many products, but more importantly was not just leaning and being, uh, you know, like reliant on, on, on vegan products per se, like processed products. Right. Um, like beyond meat wasn't out then, but a company called Gardein was, Okay. And so, you know, they definitely have meat alternatives, uh, like not, you know, non-dairy milks and um, uh, just like a variety of things that were accessible to me, you know, through Whole Foods because they they carried the most. And I was living in Florida at the time um, and the local supermarket there was Publix. And so they also I love Publix. Yeah. I miss Publix. I'm oh, with you. Yeah. So those were my two, two places. And then the farmer's market, you know, yeah. like making sure that I was eating, uh, you know, whole foods, you know, th food from the earth, you know, things that we can actually grow, um, obviously like greens and all your fruits and vegetables. And so I did during that 28 days, uh, I'm a huge fan of a, a raw chef named Matthew Kenny. Okay. And he has this book. Uh, I have it right here, actually. Um, raw Express. Oh. Everyday Raw Express. So there's like juices and smoothies and soups and all kinds of stuff in here and desserts. Uh, and so I use that book primarily uh, for all of my main meals, like dinner time. Uh, because in the morning I was juicing, I was doing smoothies for lunch. Uh, lunch always included a salad. And then like something more substantial. Um, and, and that, that was it. Amazing. And so then what 
transitioned you into, I mean, obviously you've always been interested in helping people with their, with their nutrition and with their bodies, if that was part of your, part of your original impetus, but what transitioned into where you are now? So I was working for some friends. They opened, they had a food truck. Uh, It was a vegan food truck, like raw vegan. And then they opened a cafe. Okay. And so a couple of months after they opened and we had been talking prior Uh, they wanted me to come and work for them. So I did. And so for one year, I did work with them. I did all of their, you know, behind the scenes kind of stuff. Uh, And I was managing like the floor and every, you know, front house, but I, I was transitioning to leaving. And when I did the health coach certification, you know, Elena, my friend, Elena, who owned the cafe I worked at, she was the one that said, what's going to make you, your heart sing. And, you know, I was transitioning out of my fitness career. And I said, you know, I just really want to find a way to combine my passion for food and for fitness. Mm. And I don't know how to do that. And she was like, I think you should become a health coach. So I, I was like, no, not right now. And like a week later, I, I enrolled and I did it. And it was like the best thing that I ever did you know, and then she asked me the same question again, you know, uh, later on, you know, when I was struggling with, you know, what's next for me and uh, what will make your heart sing. And I got, you know, I was cooking and I was doing all my own things and, you know, just really into this book that I was using to, to do my 28 days. And I'm like, I really want to just do for people what I did for myself, you know, because I know probably prior to that, right. If I had someone like that, then I would have been healthier, but you know, either way. So, so she's like, then you should do that. And I was like, okay. And then it's like, how am I going to make that happen? Like, right. Yeah. um, I mean, that's the thing is once we find our heart's passion, how do we also pay our bills? Like that's the, (laughs) I gotta that's, make money. That's the fun question. So now I mean, you've got your book, multiple books. I have one book, and okay. I'm working on the second one. I'm so so, and they are recipe books largely, or yes, okay. cookbooks. Uh, they're not traditional. Um, I bro, I break it down into four parts. Okay. The 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 um spark for the first book was focused on my clients and how we express love through food. And so the title of the book is food is love. And the subtitle is there are no rules in food and love because there are so many rules. And, you know, we, you know, I'm really big on not fitting into a box and everything about that book was very intentional, including the fact that it doesn't come in hardcover because I wanted it to bend like rules. I, oh, I size, love that intentionality. I love it. The size of the book is not traditional, so it cannot be distributed the same way as, uh, you know, like standard books. Uh, it's like seven and a half by nine and a quarter or something like that. And, you know, just really want people to use the recipes as a guide and then make them their own. You know, so I have a lot of people who have had my food, love my food, love, you know, really support me. And then they do, they make their, make it their own. They send me pictures and post on Instagram and things like that. And so, yeah. And that, the, so the next book will be uh, titled food is love and more. Okay. And the subtitle is love, trust, and honesty. Oh, and that I would imagine is a basis for how you work with your clients. It's kind of that, that, understanding that, I mean, you guys have to have a really honest relationship. That's the, co- the same with any coach and client. Like there has to be a certain level of trust and honesty and vulnerability, but with the stuff that you do, people are rewriting how they live their lives mm-hmm. in a very specific way. What, what is something about your work that has surprised you and how you've worked with people? None of my clients are vegan. Okay. That surprises me too. Yeah. Not okay. one I had, I had one client who had to be vegan, uh, because he had night, a nightshade, uh, allergy. Okay. And so, uh, I, I think he didn't really have to give up meat. He gave up dairy first 
And then, um, but I met him long after he'd been vegan and uh, he was the only one, but everybody else is not vegan, which I absolutely love and adore. And I actually have a preference for that because um, they're the people that need it the most, right? So I'm, I'm being of service to people who, and you said something just before, but about I don't remember exactly the words, but you know, it was, it's in line with this thought is that, you know, I I'm creating experiences for people around food that they've not had before. Yeah. And I, I'm blessed to be able to see them see food differently, you know, and, and they yeah. feel it, you know, they feel it. So I, I, I'm, I'm also surprised that I started this business seven years ago when I was living in Florida and I was prior to the pandemic going back every month to cook for some of them. Okay. And I plan to continue to do that because I'm about to get on a plane soon. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, my clients have been my clients since the very beginning. Wow. So, and so you're not located physically in Florida anymore. So how, what's the split? Do you have local clients? Is it mostly still in Florida? Like what, how does this work? Yeah, I, I do uh, split it. I have clients here and I have clients in Florida. Uh, and I also have been working part-time at Caldwell University, which is local here in New Jersey, two days a week. I cook there uh, for their you know student faculty and staff. They have an allergen-free program. It oh, yeah. primarily started as gluten-free. And then when I came on, you know, my one stipulation was that I, everything would also have to be vegan and they were like totally fine with it. Amazing. I'm so excited that more colleges, I mean, an element, I, I, somebody else on this channel actually um, spoke to me about being a, a gluten-free mother. Like her daughter was diagnosed with celiac and learning that process and what that mm -hmm. kind of all meant. And her daughter is seven right now. And so they're talking about a lot of elementary school stuff, but I'm always encouraged when universities give options for um, I mean, when I went to college, it was like my options were cereal, <laughs> Belgian waffles or whatever was, was a salad bar. Um, and then whatever was on the hot bar. And those were, that was decadence. That was the utmost of choices. Yeah. Uh, and I love this idea that now there's a lot more ways for how you want to fuel your body and how you want food and your body to interact. Because I think we're also in the middle of a, of a changing conversation about food food as less than just fuel, but food mm -hmm. as a relationship entity within our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hear it more and more now, especially through the pandemic. You know, I, I mean, I go to Whole Foods and I can't even get stuff because everybody now is really um, going after it, which of course I love. And, um, and you're also and infuriated I, by, yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> yeah, story. Like, what yeah, do you yeah. mean there's no more of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I, I love the conversations that are taking place now, the questions that I'm being asked. And I think that for sure, you know, food is an expression of love and, and back to the book, it's that I broke it down by the way I was seeing it and experiencing it with my clients, right? Love of self, love of family love of each other. And then the last part is all my love and how I kind of like, <clears throat> excuse me, came out and said, I'm, this is what I'm doing now for a living. And I, I became vegan. <laughs> I became a chef. I became a health coach, you know, and I'm like, uh, so it's just kind of, um, storytelling and each, each part. So love of self, has some of my single clients' favorite recipes. And then love of family are my family's favorite recipes. And then the each other part is um, when I cook for events like a gratitude brunch or um, a retreat. And so all of those recipes are in that section. And then the last one is kind of just more like my favorites. I love it so much. I'm almost sad to transition to what I want to talk about next because it's a little bit more of the, the negative stuff, but I just want, I want to say I love that. So the two things that when I told people that I was chatting with, with my friend who's a vegan chef, it's the questions that I'm sure you get all the time. So I, I want to give you a chance to address the two that I heard the most. And one is that it's too expensive. Mm. And the other is that you don't get enough nutrients if you don't eat 
X, Y, Z. So what mm -hmm. are your, and I'm sure you get those all the time. So what are your responses to those, to those points? Yes. Let's go with the first question about it's expensive. I will tell you that I could go to the store and spend $50 for, and eat for a week. So here's the thing. If, if you are consuming any animal proteins, right? Fish, you know, and red meats and all that, they're by far more expensive than any fruit or vegetable that's not exotic that you, that you could buy. So for instance, I was just in Whole Foods the other day with my sister and she bought salmon. It was $28 a pound. I wouldn't, she spent $40 on salmon. I was like, there's no, I walk out of here $40 of groceries, you know? And so I, it's a myth for sure that, you know, eating, eating vegan or plant-based is more expensive. The, the, where you get caught up though, is that if you're comparing like a vegan burger to a regular burger, for sure, and it's coming down, but the regular burger is less expensive than a vegan burger, right? Like right. Beyond so like Burger, two two pack. The, like the processed vegan stuff exactly. is still pretty expensive. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So in that, in that respect, I would say then, you know, you're probably right. Like a, a, a wedge of Parmesan cheese that's vegan is going to run you five, $6. And a lot of the cheeses and, and um, butters that are made from nuts are gonna be more expensive, specifically the cashew ver variety, but um, you know, and the, and the non-dairy milks are more expensive, I guess. Like I, it's like anywhere between 2.99 and 4.99 and some of them are even more expensive than that, but there's like non-dairy creamers for the coffee drinkers. Um, so anything that, anything that you eat or drink, I can have vegan for sure for the most part. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Cause we were even, I hopped into one of your lives a couple of weeks ago and I was yes. eating ice cream and you were grumpy with me that it was hot and <laughs> and not vegan. And I was just like, listen, here's, here's my truth. <laughs> you were eating my favorite haagen ice cream. I'm so sorry. Vegan. Sorry, not sorry. I was um, like, ah, oh, could they, yeah. I, and I think they make it vegan now, but they, I haven't had a do. vegan haagen -Dazs. I've gotten really into artisan ice creams over the over the pandemic. I've been trying to Gold Belly lets me like order uh, small business food from all over the country. So I've been trying to order from like the my, I found this ice cream in um, Lexington called Crank and Boom that I'm currently obsessed with. But I know I see gluten free options or like non and all of their stuff. Um, which has been really fun to kind of watch like these local creameries are doing it too. Yeah. Um, and here are the gluten-free seasonal flavors and here, the, I love it. It's been fascinating. Yeah. I mean, so many companies are incorporating, uh, you know, vegan and gluten-free products in their product lines, which is amazing. It's just, it just opens up a healthier relationship with food for people, um, a more balanced relationship. So what about the nutrients thing? I've heard you yeah. answer this before, but I, I want my, my listeners to, to hear your wisdom. Yes. Yeah, so, so nutrient wise, the biggest question is protein. And so there's protein in everything. That's just the number one fact. And, uh, in, and my example is there's even protein in iceberg lettuce because that hap that interaction happened with me. I was at a, at the cafe and we had a speaker and she asked, you know, name a food that does not have protein. So I was like iceberg lettuce. And she was like, nope. And then of course I now like Google it and I'm like uh, protein and iceberg lettuce. And it has like one gram of protein. So I know it's not a lot. It's a little, no, but it's, it's a good point. Cause like we yeah. talk about iceberg lettuce is like a nothing food. There's still nutrients <laughs> in it. Yeah, exactly. It still has something to offer. You know, it's very hydrating, uh, but just on the topic of protein, when you break down, you know, the, the total calories that you consume and percentage of each food group, right? So we have carbohydrates, we have fats, and we have proteins. 50 to 60% of your total calories should be coming from carbohydrates. Okay. And carbohydrates is like a curse word. Everybody yeah. is like, well, you I know, mean, that's Atkins, like that's, that uh, was the nineties, yeah. like, exactly. but it's, it's, it's crap. Like, and that's keto now and South beach and all of those fad diets, 
that we don't, I mean, the diet industrial complex is killing, is killing America because it's about people totally. and not about food. So that's why, like, I was always taught iceberg lettuce is wasted because it doesn't blah, 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 blah. But I was taught that by Weight Watchers. Like, I wasn't taught that by an actual <laughs> doctor. Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That's uh, bizarre that you would hear that from Weight Watchers. But yeah, so 50 to 60% of your total calories should be coming from carbohydrates. Okay. And then 30% roughly is fat which is, you would think high. And then only 10 to 15% of your total calories should come from protein. So it's very, very little. And, and that, you know, maybe for bodybuilders or like ultra marathoners, or, you know, it may be different, but there are those types of people, you know, athletes, professional athletes, ultra marathoners, like Brendan Brazier and Rich Roll, they're all vegan. And a lot, more, you know, there's a a movie on Netflix called The Game Changers. Arnold Schwarzenegger's in that. The Strongest Man is in there. And they are, they're all, you know, promoting veganism, you know, to incorporate more plant-based foods into your diet, uh, because it's it's just better for you. Recovery time, performance. Fascinating. All of it. I love it. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to, to know that I love that 60% carbohydrate thing. Cause we also need to move away from the stereotype that carbohydrates are just rice, pasta, and bread, which is the other thing exactly. Americans always think. So we need to talk more about, about fruit as a carbohydrate and, and all of those kind of things. So I, I love that entry in the 10 to 15% is fascinating. It's definitely lower than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. I get most of my, I mean, I'm definitely still a meat eater and I, I'm, we're lowering, we're doing the Michael Pollan version of a diet, which is, you know, eat more green things like less, less meat. Yeah. yeah. Um, my very, very Irish husband struggles that not every meal should have like meat and potatoes. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're moving slowly in a direction where we're getting there slowly, um, <laughs> but, which is, which is great. Everything's a journey, but I love, I love this, this concept that every a lot of what we've been taught is wrong. And so going back to people who have been trained in this stuff and not people who are trying to sell books and, exactly. and how do we really understand the, the full mechanism of the body and how, and how it kind of works. So Angelique, I'm so glad you joined us today. I'm sure my folks learned tons because um, I certainly don't talk about veganism on the rest of the channel. You are my token <laughs> vegan. Thank you so much for, yeah. for checking that box. Um, and anyone who wants to get in touch with Angelique, if you're local to Florida or New Jersey and you would like to eat her food, I cannot wait till post COVID life when I do. Um, all of her links will be in the show notes for sure, wherever you are encountering this. If this is your first time meeting Abby Research, we would love for you to hang around. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up because it really does help. And then if you like other conversations with fascinating folks or the coverage we do, we do a lot of coverage of pop culture stuff. So for instance, would you like to know about what diversity looks like in the Netflix show Bridgerton? We've got an episode by episode recap for you. If you hit subscribe, you'll get everything that you need and we'd love to see you around. In the meantime, thanks again to Angelique and we'll see you next time on Welcome to My World. Thank you.